Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to be looking at this beauty right here. Just look at her standing proudly on my desk. A 386 clone PC. Now this is one of the PCs that I picked up in a huge lot a couple of months ago which included a lot of socket 7 systems like the ones that you see here but it also included an IBM PS2 tower some interesting little compact machines, the 486DX4 that you already covered, and this 386 machine. And this has a pretty unusual form factor and design. It has the clunky power button, has a 3.5 inch disk drive, has a 5.25 inch disk drive which is mounted uh, vertically, and overall it's a really nice looking slim tower like system. So it's a clone tower 38633. So I'm guessing this is 33 megahertz, and it looks absolutely phenomenal. And just to give you a sense of perspective, here I have it sitting alongside a mini tower AT style case, my 486DX4 MIDI tower case, and my Inwin Q500 ATX case. Now before we start her up, we're going to be taking a look inside. So for that, we need to remove this side panel here, which is the only panel that you can remove from this case, besides of the front panel, of course. But if we look inside, we see the traditional things. So what we have here is the five and a quarter inch floppy drive, three and a half inch floppy drive. We have the hard drive here, and this looks to be a half height, three and a half inch model. So a very old IDE hard drive. I'm guessing it's IDE because I did see a standard 16 bit ISA controller card. So yeah, other than that, we have video card and here we have the Intel 386 CPU, very recognizable, big motherboard, eight megabytes of RAM, have some cache chips here. So. Yeah, overall system seems to be looking in pretty good shape. It does have this barrel battery, but it hasn't started leaking heavily or it didn't corrode the system as far as I can see. So I'm just going to be turning it on and see if it boots. So I absolutely love the power switch on this thing. And after a while, we do see the Trident VGA boot screen followed by the memory count with the typical PC speaker sound. So this is probably going to be 8 megabytes judging by the RAM sticks. It's initializing the floppy drives. And then it should initialize the hard drive as well and continue the boot process. But it doesn't. Instead, we're getting this fairly generic HDD controller failure, which can mean any number of things. But in this case, I am guessing that it is related to the hard drive itself, because after a few power cycles, I noticed that, you know, while normally a hard drive keeps spinning, it actually shuts itself down. So it probably encounters some kind of internal failure state and doesn't want to continue. Now, while we are waiting for a miracle in the hard drive department, we can already take a look at the system configuration here provided by the Ami BIOS. So you actually get to see a lot of information here because normally you only see the top, but in this case, we also get to see the DRAM types, the timings, the weight states, and other CMOS related information on the screen. Now this is a really old CMOS setup and it's actually comprised of two items. We have the basic CMOS setup and the extended CMOS setup or X CMOS setup. Now the basic CMOS setup allows you to configure floppy drives, hard drives, so it has kept all of its settings. So we've got the five and a quarter inch floppy drive marked as A, the three and a half inch as B. We have a user type hard drive, 100 megabytes of storage. And other than that, we have the basic stuff. Now, when entering the X CMOS setup or the extended CMOS setup, we can configure stuff like the AT bus, local memory, cache, peripherals, shadow RAM. So let's take a look. So we do get a warning that this will only work with the Elite 386 chipset. And this is a chipset that we have on the motherboard. And here we can configure stuff like CPU clocks, AT clocks, memory weight states, DMA clocks. We have lots of cache options as well. We can enable, disable the cache controller, set the caching mode. 
We can shadow both the system BIOS and the video BIOS into RAM. I'm gonna leave everything at default for now, but in a future video we might play around with these settings just to see how this will impact the performance of the overall system. But now back to the hardware. Now on the top of the case here we have two LEDs, one for power and one for hard drive activity. We have a turbo button, which also changes the LED display, and we have a reset button. Obviously you cannot miss this gorgeous power button. So it kind of reminds you of an uh, IBM machine, albeit a little bit smaller. But yeah, very satisfying to power it on and off. But now going back to the elephant in the room or the hard disk drive in the case, which is kind of lurking behind this front panel here. The power cycling obviously had a positive effect because at a certain point the machine just started booting off of the hard drive. So as we were turning on the machine, it did its memory check as usual. It was initializing the disk drives and then also the hard drive. We didn't get an error and the machine just started booting off of the hard drive without any issues. It had a version of Microsoft Windows 3.1 installed. It was branded Compaq, which you know, kind of seems strange as this is obviously not a Compaq machine. So now that we have established that the machine kind of works, let's disassemble uh, all of the components here from the machine, starting with this hard drive and floppy drive controller, which is your typical 16-bit ISA I.O. controller card. So the hard drive uh, indication LED is routed from the front of the case to this I.O. controller card. We have two serial ports here. The bracket could do with some cleaning. So let's pull the I.O. controller card out. It's a very generic 16-bit ISA controller card. has a parallel port and a game port. Here we have the VGA card, 16-bit ISA Trident TVGA8900. Now this is a baby AT form factor, despite the fact that it's actually a lot bigger than most uh, modern motherboards. Now to access the drives, we need to open up the front cover of this case as the side panel is the only panel that you can remove and the drives are actually held in place to the case with this kind of caddy system so you need to uh, get the screws off uh, from the front of the case. So both this control unit here with all the buttons and the LEDs as well as the hard drive and the disk drive are attached to this front panel. So time to remove some cables both for the hard drive and the two floppy drives. So as you can see, the three and a half inch drive doesn't use the twisted part of the cable. So this is designated drive B, but the five and a quarter inch one does have the twisted pair at the end. So this one is configured as drive A. So not only do you have to configure them properly in the BIOS, the cabling also needs to be set up correctly. And apart from its size, you can also see that this is an old hard drive by the positioning of the power cable. So we'll start by removing the three and a half inch disk drive and the hard drive. So it's held in place with two screws and then we can kind of wiggle it out of the case like so. Just have to make sure that all the cables are disconnected. We're going to do the same thing with the five and a quarter inch disk drive. And to remove the top part, uh, because it's connected to the motherboard to uh, control the LEDs and the reset switch and the turbo button, we need to remove these cables here from the motherboard. So it's always interesting to take like a picture of it, just so that you know how to uh, reconnect this dangling mess of uh, cables. A quick note on the power switch and the power supply. These four cables that you see here being routed to the power connector are connected to uh, live mains. So please make sure that you disconnect the power cable from the back of the PC before you start fiddling around with those. This is in fact physically connected to the power supply using these four, uh, I don't know, spade connectors I think they're called. So we're going to be removing those as well because we're going to be taking out the power supply also. But first we're going to take off this little part here. And obviously, you know, the reset button, the turbo button, this is just connected to this panel here because we have two buttons. And all of the cables that you see here are the turbo indicator, 
the power and the hard drive LED indicator. We also have the key lock cable here, but because we don't have any keys, we're not going to be using that one. So I'm just going to be removing the two buttons here for the turbo button and the reset button. Also has two cables being routed to the motherboard. And then it's just a matter of getting all of that out. It's a bit of a mess here, so we'll need to do some cable management in the end when we put this back together. Motherboard, we're going to be disconnecting the power, obviously, because we want to get the motherboard out. And currently that's the only cable which is still attached, sides of the PC speaker. So we're going to be removing two screws and then we can take the motherboard out. Now you can also tell that this is an old PC by looking at the size of this power supply. It didn't want to come out of the case at first, but I forgot that there was this little bracket here which kind of holds the power supply in place. And that needs to be loosened so that you can remove the power supply. But now that we have everything out of the case, we can take a look at them. All of the individual components that make up this PC. They are a bit messy, so they will need a proper cleaning. I mean, there's a lot of dust being accumulated in certain areas, like on the hard drive here, the power supply. Motherboard seems reasonably okay, except for the barrel battery, of course. But then, yeah, you have a lot of cooked on dust here on various uh, pieces. So, yeah, those will need to be cleaned up a little bit. On the bottom of the case, we also have these pair of feet here that can uh, expand and retract. Now the screws here aren't in the best of shape, so we'll probably end up replacing those as well. As you can see here, they're looking quite a bit rusty. But now let's take a look at the motherboard. And first thing that you need to do is identify it. And that was pretty difficult because the serial number sticker was obscuring the actual model number. Now, if you don't have that model number, typically while you're searching around for some chips on the motherboard and after some Googling, you should be able to track down the type of motherboard it is, especially as you have the layout of the motherboard. There are lots of sites out there which will provide you with lots of information on the motherboard. For example, here we can see that our motherboard accepts a 386DX based CPU running at 25 or 33 megahertz. It uses an elite chipset, can accept up to 32 megabytes of RAM, 128 kilobytes of cache. It has the baby AT style dimensions. It also features a 32 bit external memory card slot and it has a socket for a floating point unit. And I've always liked these baby AT style motherboards. They're substantially bigger than those, you know, typical 486 motherboards that you see. And also a lot of the later 386 motherboards are substantially narrower in width. Now this motherboard does feature this barrel type battery, which is very prone to leaking. In this case, the damage is already uh, starting on the uh, barrel uh, battery itself, but it hasn't done too much damage on the motherboard at the moment. There is a four pin header just behind the keyboard connector to hook up an external battery. So we'll make use of that. It features two eight bit ISA slots and six 16 bit ISA slots. We also have a 16 bit memory expansion slot that we can use to upgrade the onboard memory. It features an elite based chipset. So this was one of the ways that you typically identify the brand and make of a motherboard. We have eight 30 pin SIM sockets on the motherboard. They are fully populated. We have eight megabytes of RAM on this motherboard. We have two different types of uh, SIM modules. So probably it was upgraded at some point. We have some cache modules here. There's, there is 64 kilobytes of cache currently populated on the motherboard and we can upgrade it to 128 kilobytes of cache. At the heart, we have the Intel 386DX33 CPU. This one still has the warranty sticker included. It is a very recognizable CPU. 
Uh, this motherboard only accepts 25 or 33 megahertz based 386 CPU, so there isn't uh, any jumper configuration needed. We have room for an additional floating point unit, which is currently not populated here. We also have this UMC based chip here. Both the BIOS and the keyboard controller are provided by AMI or America Megatrends Incorporated. Obviously this uses a standard AT style power connector. And here we have what appears to be a 16-bit ISA slot, but this is in fact a 16-bit memory expansion slot to provide some additional memory to the motherboard. The slot is positioned at the bottom of the motherboard next to an other 16-bit ISA slot. So it uses the same form factor. Moving on to the hard drive, so this is a Toshiba MK234FCH half height 3.5 inch IDE hard drive, 100 megabytes. I really like the form factor of these things, they look really old. It has proven to be not very reliable in the sense that it does take a while before the hard drive actually kicks in and is bootable. But yeah, it's really nice to see these kind of old hard drives. I wonder if these electrolytic capacitors have something to do with it because they have started leaking, I think. So yeah, might be an option to replace those and see if that helps. So that would make an interesting uh, future video on this computer. Now the video card included here was this Trident from 1991, the TVGA 8900C. This is a pretty standard video card, nothing really special about it. You saw it in a lot of these clone-based PCs. The card features eight memory chips, 256K X4 chips, so that's 256K divided by eight times four is 128 kilobytes per chip. We have eight of them, so that makes up one megabyte of video RAM. The controller card is also pretty generic. It uses a UMC based chip, has a parallel port, game port, and you can hook up some serial ports as well. So we have lots of jumpers to configure IRQs, uh, disabling, enabling the serial and the parallel port. Features obviously connectors for the floppy drive and the hard drive. So yeah, pretty standard stuff here. Moving on to the power supply, so as I already mentioned, this is one of those big power supplies that you typically see in XT-based systems. So this is a 230 watt power supply, it has a wiring diagram for hooking up the actual power switch. And I did clean it up a little bit, but, but it could definitely use a little bit of a paint job, so that might also make for an interesting project. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to do that right now. But I did clean up the power supply and it looks in okay shape. I mean, I think this brown gunk here is just some glue which is used to glue on the capacitors onto the PCB. But other than that, I haven't seen anything that really troubles me. So yeah, the PC does turn on, so that's already a good thing. So I'm just going to be leaving the power supply in this PC as is. I also cleaned up the four feet which can be mounted or which have to be mounted on the bottom of the case because otherwise you can't put the case on the floor or on a desk. So it uses this mechanism that they, you know, can be extracted. So yeah, it kind of finishes off the look and feel of this PC, I think. So yeah, pretty nice mechanism here. Now, one thing I noticed as I was starting the PC is that this Trident boot screen was kind of black and white. Now, normally when you boot up a PC with the Trident card, it actually looks like this. So you have this colorful splash screen, but this wasn't the case here. And even worse, as the PC was booting, it was completely black and white. So as I was launching uh, Windows 3.1, it was also black and white. When I launched the edit program in MS-DOS, it was also black and white. So it needed kind of a reboot to uh, set it up in, in color mode, as it were. And this apparently has to do with the fact that the LCD uh, and the Trident card don't play well together. And the video card doesn't properly detect this as being a color panel. Now, this isn't an issue if you're hooking up a CRT monitor. There, it always boots up in color mode. 
We're also going to be adding some sound to our 386. So I have a number of ISA sound cards here that might prove to be a good fit for this 386. I've got this Aztec uh, sound card here with the Yamaha OPL3 chip. I also have this Jazz 16 sound card also with the Yamaha chip. I think these are yeah, more or less time period correct. There might be a little bit later than 1991, but I think it will do. I also have some uh, newer ISA cards, have some creative cards here. Most of the really old video uh, sound cards are already in PC, so these are the only ones that I have uh, freely available now. So yeah, all the other ones are more modern ISA cards. So I'm probably gonna go with uh, this one to see you know, what the sound output will be. Love this volume rocker here at the backside uh, of this card. I also want to include a networking card. So I was lucky enough to pick up this boxed uh, Novell networking card here with the uh, original driver disc and a manual. So I'm probably going to try this one. It's a 16-bit ISA card from 1990. So yeah, that would be an excellent fit. It only has a coaxial connector, so that's a bit of a bummer. I do have a slightly more recent Novell card from 1991. Pretty similar, but this one has the RJ45 connector, so that will be more convenient to set up. So I'll probably end up using one of these to provide some network connectivity. So until then, I hope you've enjoyed this video. So there will be a part two featuring this computer. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you guys very soon in a future video. Bye-bye.